Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in. Uh, those that have tuned in on multiple occasions have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road. And we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays. And we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. Last week, we looked at uh, the first two stages of what it means to uh, possess a hardened heart. And we saw the Pharaoh factor. We saw how Pharaoh and King Saul possessed insecurities and fears, which led them into cultivating a heart that was uh, harboring an insincerity towards or insensitivity towards God's word. The hardening of their hearts led them into sin, which led them into uh, judgment, which was, uh, for their cases, irrevocable, uh, irreversible. Uh, so I want to remind you of, of the definition of a hardened heart. It means possessing a hard heart is an obstinate, stubborn, rebellious, willful rejection of God's word, his will, and his ways. Again, possessing a hard heart is an obstinate, stubborn, rebellious, willful rejection of God's word, his will, and his ways. So I want to set the stage for this, this next portion of uh, where we're heading for the, the other two ways in which we can possess a, a hardened heart. Uh, Jeremiah, back in the Old Testament, the young prophet from God was proclaiming judgment, uh, and judgment was coming. Uh, and in some cases already had. And uh, just as the other prophets along with Jeremiah, they were prophesying that God was using the Babylonian Empire to bring them into captivity. They were a wayward people. Their, their cup of sin had been full and God was pouring out judgment. Well, throughout uh, the land in Judah, the king of Babylon set up governors and they would rule the, the remaining people in the lands. Well, uh, some of the Jews, they formed militias and they began to rebel uh, to the point where uh, one of them, uh, by the name of Ishmael, he killed one of the king's governors and then he killed 80 men that were also part of uh, the force there to keep the, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people in check. And then he took some of his fellow Jews into captivity. So then there was another Judean militia led by Johanan, and he fought against Ishmael, took back all the captives. Now, you got to understand that through the prophets, though the prophets had spoken, the judgment would come. Johanan, his small army, his officials, uh, they included the survivors, including women and children. They gathered near Bethlehem to make plans to settle in the land of Egypt. They were afraid of the consequences that might befall them because of you know, the governors uh, that was set up and then the 80 men. They were afraid that they'd be deported, they'd be killed, they'd be tortured, they'd be led into captivity. So they made their appeal to Jeremiah the prophet. So we're going to pick this up, Jeremiah 42, 1 through 6. So it says, then all the army officers, including uh, Johanan, son of Korea, and Jezaniah, son of Hoshiah, and all the people from the least to the greatest approached Jeremiah the prophet and said to him, please hear our petition in prayer to the Lord your God for this entire remnant. For as you now see, though we were once many, now only a few are left. Pray that the Lord your God will tell us where we should go and what we should do. I have heard your reply, Jeremiah the prophet, uh, said Jeremiah the prophet. I will certainly pray to, to the Lord your God as you have requested. I will tell you everything the Lord says and will keep nothing back from you. Then said, uh, they, then they said to Jeremiah, may the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act in accordance with everything the Lord your God sends you to tell us. This is a good place to be, right? You want to inquire of God and you want to hear what he has to say. Whether it's favorable or unfavorable, we will obey the Lord our God to whom we are sending you so that it will go well with us, for we will obey the Lord our God. It sounds really great. If they do this, 
if they do this. It sounds like, wow, there's been some repentance. There's been, they, they, they're seeking the face of God. Ten days later, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. So he gathered uh, Johanna, the son of Korea, all the army officers, all the people from the, from the least to the greatest. And he said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your petition, says to you. If you stay in this land, if you stay in this land, I will build you up and not tear you down. I will plant you and not uproot you. For I am grieved over the disaster I have inflicted on you. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you now fear. His insecurities, his fear. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord, for I am with you and will save you and deliver you from his hands. I will show you compassion so that he will have compassion on you and restore you to your land. Wow, what a promise. What an amazing promise. I will be with you. I'll, I'll change the heart of the king. He's going to let you live in your land and you'll be protected. So he spoke. He addressed their insecurities. He addressed their fears. And he's saying, just trust me. Trust my guidance. Even though they'll be under Babylonian rule, God foretold that he'd keep them safe. But notice the promise comes with a stern warning. We keep going. He says, however... Don't you hate that? <laughs> However, if you say we will not stay in the land and so disobey the Lord your God. And if you say, no, we will go and live in Egypt where we will not see war or hear the trumpet or be hungry for bread. Then hear the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. If you are determined to go to Egypt and you do not, I'm sorry, and you go and settle there, then the sword you fear will overtake you. And the famine you dread will follow you into Egypt, and there you will die. Indeed, all who are determined, most how he uses this word, determined to go to Egypt to settle there, will die by the sword, famine, and plague. Not one of them will survive or escape the disaster I will bring on them. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. As my anger and wrath have been poured out on those who lived in Jerusalem, and you're going to see why, so will my wrath be poured out on you when you go to Egypt. You will be an object of cursing and horror, of condemnation and reproach, and you will never see this place again. That is a very stern warning. And these people, it's not, I mean, they go to Jeremiah, you, you, know, you go on our behalf, what, if it's favorable or not, we don't care. We, we want to hear from God. You know, we, we just, we, we want to be blessed. It's so resting here to, to see that... Uh, the Lord tells them several times not to disobey the command. Don't be determined to go to Egypt. Wow. And he even gives consequences to, to me are alarming. I wouldn't want to go through this. But then we enter the third stage of what molds and shapes a hardened heart. Number one, on your outline, the back of your bulletin. The third stage of hardness of heart is an irreverent hypocrisy. It's an irreverent hypocrisy. Let me explain it this way. It is a, a spiritual irreverence to God as a disrespectful, mocking, rule, bold, flippant lack of reverential fear of God or his revealed will, which comes from his word. In this case, it was his word to Jeremiah. This is a stage where a person really is no longer teachable and worse they become deceitful in their stubbornness and their rebellion. They come across as wanting guidance and direction, as having a form of godliness, but in reality, they are determined to go their own way. Jeremiah 42, 19 through 22. The Lord has said concerning you, O remnant of Judah, do not go to Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day, for you were hypocrites in your hearts when you sent me to the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us to the Lord our God, and according to all that the Lord your God says. So declare to us, and we will do it. And I have this day declared to you, but you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God or anything which he has sent you by me. Now, therefore, know certainly that you shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence in the place where you desire to go and to dwell. In other words, Jeremiah knew these, your hearts aren't sincere. You're hypocrites. 
you want God's stamp of approval, but you're going to do what you want to do anyway. And it's a total disregard for the revealed will and word of God. You see, letter A, spiritual disrespect leads to spiritual insincerity and deceit. The insincerity is that these leaders and their followers possessed was a hypocrisy, a deception. They really didn't desire guidance from God. If, if it was what they wanted to hear, then they would do it. But if it's something that goes against their determined will, they won't. The King James uses the word for you dissembled in your hearts. Dissemble, that means to vacillate, to deceive, to wander. And then in parentheses, it says in the Hebrew, hypocritical. Man. And this shouldn't shock us at all that they did this because we see it all the time. We see people reject the word of God, his revealed will to us in the person of Jesus Christ. People have been doing this for years. So it shouldn't shock us. In fact, Paul told Timothy in his second letter, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Having a form of godliness, oh, Jeremiah, go on our behalf. That's a form of godliness. Represent us. Here's our petitions. Here's our prayer. We're seeking the face of God. Oh, no. That's a form of godliness and denying the power to live in the word of God. So was Jeremiah guessing at the motives of their hearts? No. Dissembled also means to wander about physically. To wander in the mind and to have sin in your heart, ethically. <sighs> Jeremiah was given discernment concerning these people. Here's the thing, though. Letter B, the deceitfulness of a person's hardened heart is that they are predetermined to, debate, to disobey God's revealed will. The deceitfulness of a person's hardened heart is that they are predetermined to disobey God's revealed will. Notice Jeremiah 42, 15b, if you are determined to go to Egypt, the Lord was willing to fulfill his promises to this remnant if they trusted him, if they would stay where they are, but he knew they wouldn't. He knew their hearts. You see, let us see, many times we are in a place where God's desire is for us to stay where we are so that we can conquer our fears and can experience restoration. Let me say this again, because this is sometimes hard. Many times we are in a place where God's desire is for us to stay where we are so that we can conquer our fears, which lead to insecurities, which is part of a hard heart, and so we can experience restoration. God was willing, to, remember this, he was willing to bless them. I'll be with you. I'll change the, the, uh, the king of Babylon's heart. I mean, I'm, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to restore you to this land. And they, they, no, they were determined to do their own thing. See, if we flip this into our day and age, our prayers are not always answered according to our desires, are they? God calls us to take action sometimes when it seems confusing, when it seems frightening. But when we don't trust him, when we reason in our minds, that's when we begin to disobey which for some of us seems a lot easier and safer to do, right? What some people fail to realize is God knows every dilemma we'll ever face. He knows our fears. He knows our motives. He knows our plans. Yet he still says in Jeremiah 42, 11 through 12, he still says to him, do not be afraid of the king of Babylon whom you now fear. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord. I am with you and will save you and deliver you from his hands. I will show you compassion. I mean, look at the, all the I wills and do not be afraid. You know what? Jesus tells us that today. Don't be afraid. We see it in his word all over the place in the New Testament. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'll have compassion, he says, on you and restore you to the land. 
You see, in this spiritual war that we are engaged in, what the enemy loves to do is to capture our minds, to capture our minds, to get us to dwell on fear, to, give us to, to, to get us to dwell on insecurity. Because when we do that, we begin to look for every other option instead of trusting God. You see, the enemy wanted these people to trust in themselves. They got a better plan not to obey the will of God. And really, not to obey the will of God is, is really the essence of what it means not to fear him. They didn't even fear the consequences. They were determined to go. Whew. Letter D. There will be times when obedience is not always a favorable or comfortable decision. There will be times when obedience is not always a favorable or comfortable decision. Be it an unfavorable situation, a condition, be it difficult people. I mean, the list can go on and on and on. In this case, it was about staying in Judah and submitting to the powers that be while trusting God in the process. But they, tro they chose poorly. Look at number two. The fourth stage of hardness of heart is insolence. It's insolence. <clears throat> Jeremiah 43, 1 through 6. When Jeremiah finished telling the people all the words of the Lord, their God, everything the Lord had said and to, to tell them, Azariah, son of Hoshiah, and Johanan, son of Korea, and all the arrogant, arrogant, Men said to Jeremiah, you are lying. Imagine this. Ah, you're lying. The Lord our God has not sent you to say you must not go to Egypt to settle there. But Baruch, son of Neriah, is inciting you against us to hand us over to the Babylonians that they may kill us and carry us into exile to Babylon. So Johanan, son of Korea, and all the army officers and all the people disobeyed the Lord's command to stay in the land of Judah. Instead... Johanna, son of Korea, and all the army officers led away all the remnant of Judah who had come back to live in the land of Judah from, from the nations where they had been scattered. They also led away all the men, women, and children, and the king's daughters whom Nebu, Nebu uh, well, this guy here, commander of the imperial guard, had left with uh, Gedaliah, son of Achium, the son of Shapham, and Jeremiah, the prophet, and Baruch, son of Neariah. Wow. I'm taking a break. <laughs> but look at what happens. When you're not willing to follow the will of God, you have an influence on others. And these guys did. And they led the whole remnant, the whole remnant, out of the will of God. Every single one of them. The word arrogant means proud and insolent. Showing an aggressive lack of respect in speech and behavior. It's a contempt towards God. And then you look at verse 7, and it says, So they entered Egypt in disobedience to the Lord and went as far as Tapanese. And you can look it up yourself in Jeremiah 43, 8 through, 8 through 13. It's all the judgment that God was going to bring on this place alone. On this place alone. And it says in verse 5 through 8, but they did not listen or pay attention. They did not turn from their wickedness. And here's why. There's something behind the insolence. There's something behind the insecurity. There's something behind uh, a hardened heart. It says they would not stop burning incense to other gods. They were involved in false worship. They had a divided heart from the get-go in what it means to serve God. So therefore, my fierce anger was poured out. It raged against the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem and made them desolate ruins they are today. Now, this is what the God, Almighty God, the God of Israel says. Why bring disaster on yourselves by cutting off from Judah the men and women, the children, the infants, and so leave yourselves without a remnant? Why provoke me to anger with what your hands have made, burning incense to, to the gods of Egypt? That's why they want to go back. You will destroy yourselves and make yourselves an object of cursing and reproach among the nations on earth. 
He goes on, have you forgotten the wickedness committed by your forefathers and by the kings and queens of Judah and the wickedness committed by you and your wives in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? To this day, they have not humbled themselves or shown reverence, nor have they followed my law and my decrees I have set before you and your fathers. This is why God judged. And it's worse. You're thinking, well, so what? They're making a bunch of cakes and, and offer them to some, some God. Yeah, they were, they were trusting in wood and brass and it for deliverance and for blessing. But it went much deeper, much deeper. You see, letter A, when a person is in a stage four of possessing a hard heart, they do not fear the Lord nor his judgments. When you're in stage four of possessing a hard heart, you won't fear the Lord nor his judgments. And this gets very sobering here. I want you to see this. So you got, you got to understand, there's some, there's some idol worship in the background here. Then all the men who knew that their wives were burning incense to other gods, along with all the women who were present, a large assembly, and all the people living in lower and upper Egypt said to Jeremiah, we will not listen to the message you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord. So it wasn't just the guys. There was a lot of women here that said, we're not going to do this. We like what we're doing. We will certainly do everything we said. We would. We will burn incense to the queen of heaven, Ishtar, and, and we'll pour out drink offerings to her just as we did and our fathers, our kings and our officials did in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. This is insolence. I don't care what you say, God. I'm going to do what I want to do. Wow. And they gave a reason why. At the time, we had plenty of food and were well off and suffered no harm. But ever since we stopped burning incense to the Queen Ever and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have had nothing and have been perishing by sword and famine. In other words, blessings come from her, not from God. Well, I've watched so many people base decisions on insecurity and fear. People who don't wait on God. People that just refuse to wait. And then they step out and they get themselves in a world of hurt. And they enter into compromise. And I've seen everything from, from people just deliberately uh, you know, doing things exactly according to the dictates of their heart. And it's led to fornication, adultery, homosexuality, you name it, it happens. I'm going to do what I want. I don't care what God's word says. I don't care. I've watched people actually take the word of God and say that's not true for today. In other words, they're calling God a liar. That was in the Old Testament. That's not in the New Testament. I've heard the arguments. The Lord said, I'm going to bring disaster to you. But I want you to see something. Why did he bring judgment to begin with? The hearts were hardened. Years earlier... It started by refusing to obey the Lord's commands. It started with burning incense to false gods, and then it graduated into all kinds of sexual perversion and worse. In fact, we go all the way back to chapter 7. The Lord was so grieved. He told Jeremiah, he says, So do not pray for this people, nor offer any plea or petition for them. Do not plead with me, for I will not listen to you. Do you not see what they are doing in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? This was before Babylonian captivity. He says, the children gather wood, the fathers light the fire, the women knead the dough and make cakes of bread for the queen of heaven. They pour out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. So do not listen or pay attention. Instead, they, they followed their stubborn inclinations of the evil hearts and they went backward and not forward. From the time of your forefathers left Egypt until now, day after day, again and again, I sent you my servants and prophets, but they did not listen or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and did more evil than their forefathers. More evil? How can you do more evil? Well, let me show you. I want you to see this. Jeremiah 7, verses 30 and 31. The people of Judah have done evil in my eyes, declares the Lord. They have set up their detestable idols in the house that bears my name 
and have defiled it. They have built the high places of Topheth in the valley of Ben-Hinnom to burn their sons and daughters in the fire. Something I did not command, nor did it enter my mind. They got so hard-hearted and so perverted in their ways that they were willing to give their infant babies to be sacrificed. How can a mother and father become so hard-hearted, become so deceived that they would sacrifice their own children to an idol? You go all the way back to Leviticus, Way before this happened, and the Lord spoke and said, Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Molech. How did this all come about? Well, remember the very wise king? Remember the wise guy king, King Solomon, right? All that wisdom. And then he married had a thousand wives and concubines and all. And the Lord had said way back when the people asked for a king, when Saul became king, he, the Lord said, the, 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 a king will have many wives and those wives will lead him away from me. Solomon, who wrote Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, all this wisdom and all. Look at verse King, uh, uh, 1 Kings 11, 4 through 8. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Asherus, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built these places. Think of this. You come out of the temple of God and you just look down the street. And he set up places of false worship, places where they would do this. I want you to see the horror of what would take place. This place obtained wide notoriety as the scene of the barbaric and inhumane rites that were committed by the idolatrous kings of Judah. And it started with Solomon. A monster idol of brass was made in the body of a human with an ox's head and was erected in the opening of the valley facing the steep side of Mount Oblet. Where the idol was thoroughly, when the idol was thoroughly heated, its arms were outstretched like this and there was this big brass brazen saucer. When it was heated, thoroughly heated, the infatuated inhabitants of Jerusalem who were, were ecstatic in this worship, committing all kinds of sin in the process, they would give their babies to the priest who would cast them into the red hot arms of this idol. The priest cast the babies into the hands while drums were being beaten to drown out the cries of the infants so that the parents wouldn't relent. This is history. Archaeologists have found this. In fact, I, they found an area the size of a football field a couple feet deep with the remains, the charred bones of infants. And how can a holy, just God who chose these people allow that to continue? He can't. He had to judge. And he brought the Babylonians. Let me tell you this. If a nation continues in their evil, do you feel God will at some point bring about judgment? Yes. It's been said, if, if he doesn't bring judgment to America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm not going to get legalistic. I'm just going to get real. Uh, we've built high places. In America. Planned Parenthood is a high place. The word of God says thou shalt not murder. And no matter how you twist it, no matter how you play it out, you can call it right of choice, you can call it whatever you want, it is still taking the life of God's creation. And we don't dance around and have drum beats and all. We just, we use salt solutions 
while the baby is in the mother's womb and those cries and those screams we don't hear. In the vacuum, it tears their, their limbs apart. In the screams, we, we don't hear that. But it's amazing to me, God's word says, thou shalt not kill. And yet this book that we call the Bible is considered antiquity and it doesn't really, it's not relevant for today. Therefore, you know, that's the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament anyway. Let me just share a couple of things I wrote down because I, I get really upset about this. I wrote these down this morning. Worldwide, as of 20 minutes ago, and, and, and the life was every few seconds, it was an abortion. But as of about 20 minutes ago, over, over 5,078,486 uh, abortions were committed. 104,000 in America since the beginning of this year. 104,073. And it was taken off as I closed it. There's been, this is a big number. Overall, as of today, since Roe v. Wade throughout the world, 1, 1, 644, 600, no, I'm sorry, 1,644,695,079. And that ticker was going off like this as I was writing these numbers. And you say, well, how do you stop this? Well, here's, here's what grieves my heart. California, Maryland, and New Hampshire, they don't have to report the numbers of abortions they do. So these statistics are, are yeah, and, and then there's so many abortions that are done that haven't been recorded. Globally, this was in the years 2010 to 2014, 25% of all pregnancies ended in abortion, 25%. 30% of those claim to be Protestant. 24% of those abortions in, that, in, in, in those years were by Catholics. 30% Protestant, 24. People that call on God, name God their God. This will break your heart. In 2010 to 2014, 73% of all abortions worldwide, or 40 mil, 41 million annually, were obtained by married women. Married women. You realize the statistics of a 15-year-old and, and younger is only 0.02%? This is some hard hearts. And it's based out of fear and insecurity. And I know there's been some that have made decisions because it's been taught and it's not a big thing, but I also see the insolence. I think it was three years ago at men's group, I had a, a video on my phone of this woman. She was interviewing two junior high kids and the title of her Facebook page was Shout Your Abortion. And she was telling these little 12, 13 year olds why it's a good thing to get an abortion with insolence. And she said, we're not going to let a bunch of old white men tell us what to do. You know what I hear in that? An echo from years and years ago. We're not going to let Jeremiah tell us what to do. We're going to still sacrifice. We're going to do what we want. According to the World Health Organization, every year in the world, there are an estimated 40 to 50 million abortions. In America right now, there's over 3,000 abortions per day. Per day. And here's what grieves my heart. And I know, it, I'm going to say this, I'm going to make some enemies, and I don't care. I know how hard it was in 2020 to choose a president. I didn't vote for a man. I voted for a policy, a policy that would protect the innocent and shame on the millions of Christians that didn't stand and do that. And I've heard excuses after excuses. I don't buy it. Oh, well, Trump put in three justices and so it'll take care of itself. I've even had Christians, one was a worship leader, Look me in the eye a few years ago and say, Peter, they're not human until they're born. 
a worship leader, Bible teacher. We've become hardened in our hearts. Really, how many of you even thought about abortion this last week? It's become just so normal in America. And we serve a holy, righteous God. And you don't think that he's not going to step in at some point and judge this world? He, he will. And right now we're living in this amazing year of his favor where people can be forgiven. But it's not just the abortion issue. There's hard hearts when it comes to all kinds of stuff. I've done marriage counseling where I knew before I even got off the phone, before I even met with the couple, that the man was determined to leave his wife and break his vows. And after six weeks, it's what he did. I've watched women just fly in the arms of other men with a whole family and just break the heart of her husband. Hardness of heart, you know, it's not a respecter of any person. If we don't stay close into the holiness of God, it just takes about 10 minutes to start drifting. We need to be perpetually aware of God's holiness. But I've watched men. I was, one day I brought a, a young man home. It was in our youth ministry. Just as watch, his dad was filling, running from the house to his truck, filling his truck up with his junk. His belongings. And I knew what he was doing because I'd been counseling with him, but I knew in his heart what he was going to do. And it was, he had four kids, two little ones. It was a six-year-old's birthday. And I stepped in and I, and I asked him, what are you doing? And he said, get out of my way. I'll put you down. And he would have. And he left his family that day. Left his family that day. That's hardness of heart. He loved his drugs more than his family. Hardened hearts, rage, slander, discord. I mean, it just, it goes on and on. And all these things committed by Christians too. People that call on the name of the Lord. What has happened? We've gotten away from the holiness of God. His majesty. Blessed is the man who always fears the Lord, but he who hardens his heart falls into trouble. Falls into trouble. Letter B, every sin can be traced back to its root, the pride of a hardened heart. George Lawson says, he is not an unhappy man whose heart is continually governed by this fear. It is as a happy influence upon his soul to guard it from the temptations of Satan in the world and to keep it close to the Redeemer. It tends not to obstruct, but to promote the exercise of faith and hope and joy in the Lord. Thus, fear is a fruit of the Holy Spirit and a blessed means of establishing the heart in the love of God. It is a happy sign of an interest in the everlasting covenant of mercy and in that special favor of God, which is the source of all our joys. But wretched is the man who is not afraid to sin against his maker and his judge. His heart is hard as a millstone. And I'm watching this falling away that Jesus said would happen. We're living in the ends of days. I believe that. And it breaks my heart. And yet, he forgives. Think about this. He's, he's speaking to this remnant. He already has judged. But he's speaking to this remnant that was part of what took place. Years earlier with these gods and the, and the sacrificing of their children. And he's still offering grace to them. Just like he does in the person of Jesus Christ to the world today. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wow, we have this, this amazing invitation to experience the God of heaven. The holy, pure, righteous God making us clean, making us acceptable in his sight. And that to me is a miracle. But I'm watching, especially in our country, insecurity, insensitivity, irreverence, and insolence. Those are the four things that build a hardened heart. And man, have we got a hardened heart. I've had people get in my face about abortion and they, they say, well, what do you do? 
And I said, well, I, I give to a couple of different pregnancy resource centers and I, and, and, and some of them, you know, they, they, they provide housing and they, they, you know, give diapers and whatnot. And then there's the ultrasounds and 80% of women that see that and hear that heartbeat and see that baby, they, they won't go through with it because that's truth and they're not being told truth. And I had, I've had several people look at me and go, that's not enough. Is that even an argument? Does that even make sense? It's not enough. You know, I, 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 if I can save one child, wow, but that's still not enough for me. But if I can save one child, I'd rather save one child than not do anything and sit there and point the finger and say, you don't do enough. That's why I don't follow your God. What? Does that make sense? No. But what I do know is God forgives. And I've seen where God forgives the worst of sins. And we're living in that time of grace. And my fear is that, you know, I roll off the table with this second chance. And, and I, I, I can't help but speak truth even with more passion than what I had before. Because I know time is short. See, number three, the only remedy for a hard heart is God's grace given to us in Jesus through forgiveness, which bursts within us a new obedience and a renewed reverential fear. We can't, we can't hold people accountable uh, outside of Christ until he gets a hold of their hearts. But boy, I can speak against those that champion the cause of abominations and sin, that call themselves believers. I can challenge them. But God will deal with the unsaved and, and, and praise him and pray that he changes the hearts of a mother. It's a blessing to see a mom change her heart before she gets an abortion. It's really hard after they do. And there's a lot, there's story after story after story. Two, three, four, 20 years later, a woman's had an abortion and has a ton of regrets. And you see, Planned Parenthood doesn't tell you about that. They won't tell you about that because the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Do you understand the war we're in? The spiritual war that we are in? But here's what God promises. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of the countries and will bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols and I will cleanse you. A new heart also I will give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. I believe this is part, part of this fulfillment is right now in New Testament times. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you this, letter A, God's people are not chosen because they're holy. They are chosen that they may become holy. Yeah. Which brings me to this. If my people, he's not talking about the heathen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And he's done that in Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he's lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ Jesus. There was a man that he loved writing songs, wrote 51 of them. He wrote one and he introduced it to his church. And, and, and uh, yeah, he, in fact, he wanted to, to put together a new song book and uh, the church leadership was no. They thought it was too contemporary, which is, no, we're not gonna do this. And so uh, this guy was so passionate. He just wanted to put this song book together for the church and, and, and all. And so the leaders to be, they just, expelled him basically sent him to the uh, some obscure village to silence his voice and his passion and he ended up uh, dying and his wife took his songs and published them the first song that he presented that the Lon uh, the bishop of london said no way holy 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 
too contemporary in the 1700s? Seriously? Yeah, it was too contemporary. They, they didn't like it. They weren't impressed by it. And it's based out of Revelation 4, 8 through 11. This song paints a powerful picture of the thoughts we can look forward to in eternity. I mean, this song has had seismic ripples through time and space and its impact the culture of the church. Can you imagine that? Reinheld Heber in the 1700s. We're going to visit this song today. It's an amazing song. You've all heard it. Holy, holy, holy. This is where we need to be. In that place where we're so close to God that the world doesn't sound confusion because we know truth. This place where we're so close to God that, man, we don't want to break his heart. We just, we're responding to his love and working our salvation out in that love. Not because we have to, but because we want to. To be so close to God that his holiness and his purity, we, we see it and we taste it. And yet when we look at the world, we're grieved. To be in that place where we're so close to God that, man, he keeps our hearts in check. And when we see the insecurities coming, when we see the times where we could become insolent, where we could become hard and just want our own way, where we're sensitive enough to let the Holy Spirit change us. Because it only takes 10 minutes out of the presence of God 